It's the 7th of October, and that means one year ago today we saw the first full episode of Doctor Who starring Jodie Whittaker as the Doctor. So, every week I'm going to be reviewing an episode on its one year anniversary and seeing if my opinions have changed on it, seeing if it's got better in my opinion, got worse in my opinion, and just generally giving a review as we go through the series. And when we get to the end, I've got a few ideas of things I would like to see in Series 12 and things I don't want to see ever again. However, let's make a start with the woman who fell to Earth. Much like when John Nathan Turner took over producing Doctor Who, the first scenes of Chris Chibnall's vision of Doctor Who make it very clear that we have a very different show on our hands from what has come before. We start off with Ryan's vlog, of course, but then we get that beautiful shot over Sheffield with Ryan trying to learn to ride his bike. And straight away, we're introduced to three really charming characters. We've got Ryan, we've got Graham, and we've got Grace. I loved that first scene, and I think Tosin Cole does an excellent job of playing a young man with a condition that affects his ability to live and to do things that a lot of us take for granted. You know, I didn't learn to ride a bike until I was 27, and that wasn't because of any condition, that was just because I didn't do it. And that was hard for me, I mean, imagine what it's like for someone with dyspraxia. And I think the example of the bike, which is something that's very complex when you think about it, but once you know how to do it, it doesn't seem very complex, is a really good way to put it. And then Ryan throws the bike off the mountain. <laughs> And the look on his face is hilarious. And that's what kickstarts the story, of course, because Ryan finds Simshar's transport capsule. It's also what brings Yaz into the story, who's the last of our companions to be introduced. She's a young probationary police officer dealing with really quite, well, trivial parking offences that then turn into wanton property destruction. So we have our three companion characters, and all the publicity told us it's going to be Yaz, Ryan, and Graham. They each had little commercials as well, so it's very clearly going to be these three, and we get an idea of each of them in their first scenes. And really, all of that is done in about the first six or seven minutes. It's quite clever writing, but it is helped by the fact that Ryan and Graham are related, which keeps Yaz a bit on the outer, I find. and. Well, I think that'll be a theme going through this season as well. But then the Doctor appears, and <laughs> straight away, it ties in with how we last saw her. <laughs> and it's funny when you think, we last saw her Christmas 2017, which means she's been falling for nine months. Okay. And yet, crashes through the roof of the train. We already know that Time Lords who are in a regenerative state can heal their bodies. And I just love how she gets up, and sort of her first word is, what? What's wrong? What? Oh, giant monster, okay. And immediately she jumps into action, attacks it, she tries to get information, and she becomes a sort of detective character in that first scene. The moment where she realises she's a woman is great as well, because casting a woman as the Doctor was met with mixed responses, let's say. Um, Mostly very supportive, but some very vocal uh, voices against that idea. It does have to be addressed, of course, that the Doctor is now a woman, and just having the moment be her saying, why are you calling me madam? Oh, am I a woman? Does it suit me? No, never mind, we're moving on. It reiterates the point that it doesn't matter whether the Doctor is a man or a woman, it matters whether the Doctor is the Doctor. And that is the question the rest of this episode asks. Is this person the Doctor? Is she capable of solving this mystery and saving the characters? It's amazing how post-regeneration stories like to go back to Spearhead from Space for some of the tropes there. So here we've got, you know, the Doctor in a coma and feeling the double pulse beat as Grace does. We've got an alien menace that arrives on Earth at the same time as the Doctor, and so they're linked that way. What we don't have here is a previous companion or previous guest character coming in and wondering, is that really the Doctor? And while the Doctor's incapacitated, it gives the other characters all something to do. They all go off and investigate the problem in their own different ways. Graham with the bus drivers, Yaz at the police station, Grace messages her WhatsApp group, and Ryan goes on the internet. All of which 
are things inside these characters' experiences. You have a internet savvy character in the form of Ryan, you have a sort of lie of the land character in the form of Graham, you've got uh, Grace with her medical expertise and you've got Yaz with her police expertise. So they're demonstrating how each of these characters can function within the show. Then of course the Doctor wakes up and the moment for me that she becomes the Doctor is that that sort of streak of inconsiderateness the Doctor has. So the Doctor realises, oh, I need Ryan's phone. I'm going to grab Ryan's phone. I formatted Ryan's phone. Doesn't ask for permission. And when Ryan is dismayed, doesn't try and console him or anything, because that's what she needs right now. She needs that phone. And it's the kind of thing other Doctors do as well. There's also the crane operator, Carl, who's just like, no, no, I don't want to do this. No, not interested. Bye, I'm off. And the Doctor just lets him go. There's no kind of goading of him. There's no saying, oh, you're a coward, you're a pudding brain, this, that, the other. And, you know, that gives you an idea of her character as well. She wants to be around people who want to be around her, who are interested in solving the mystery. And I think that's really important. I'm really glad when the investigation gets underway because I do feel the first third of the episode has some pacing issues. And I think there's some things which could be tied together that aren't. We know that Ryan, for instance, is studying a mechanics course and Rahul, the young man whose sister was taken by the Stenza who finds the pod, seems to be a mechanic. So why could it not be that these two know each other? Now, I know it's a level of coincidence we don't necessarily need in the plot, but I think it could have got us to Rahul's garage a bit quicker. As for the Stenza himself, Tim Shah or Tim Shaw, I'll probably alternate between the two. Look, I think he's a really interesting creation and we're given an inkling of this race's culture, sort of akin to when we're given background for the Sontarans or the Silurians. There's a mythos to them, there's a society, and there's a way things work. And we're also told that Simshar is a cheat. But what is so Doctor Who about this for me is that the ridiculous is put right up against the horrific. And that is so evident when Simshar kills the kebab man. <laughs> the guy with the kebab who became Twitter famous for a few weeks, the actor, and actually bought himself a kebab and posed with a picture of it. I hope he got lots more work after that. That scene is hilarious. I saw this in the cinema and that scene got a big laugh, you know, until he gets killed. And the Stenza kill in horrific ways. They freeze your head and then break your jaw and rip a tooth out. But I think this is a lot more responsible than the violence shown in Torchwood because we're not shown the aftermath. You know, it's sort of described. And even in classic Doctor Who, we'd have things described like, you know, people being eaten from the inside out or having all their life energy drained away. And we either wouldn't see it or we would only see the remains. The Doctor confronting Tim Shaw on the roof, another great scene. All of the supporting cast get something to do and the Doctor is given another chance to assert her character and in particular her desire for fair play, as she puts it. Now, it's not like she would have been happy if the hunt had just been a hunt. She's already unhappy about that, but to have Simshar cheating as well, that just gives her extra impetus to make sure he doesn't get what he wants. This brings us to the confrontation in the crane yard as Simshar is hunting down Carl. I have seen from some quarters people say, why couldn't it have been Ryan? You know, he's the one who brought the Stenza to Earth and he could have easily been the target. It would have given more emotional involvement. But I think it says something really important about this Doctor. The Doctor has always tried to save people whether you're their companion or you're not. This puts up front and centre, as far as the Doctor is concerned, your life matters. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're travelling with the Doctor or if you have actively rejected the Doctor. She is going to try and save you. And her trying to convince Carl to just, you know, step over. Just step over onto the other crane is hilarious. And then when Carl is taken prisoner, her frustration is great. And then she realises who she is. You know, all of this excitement has made her aware of who she is and what she stands for. And she gives Sim Shah a chance to get away. You know, she says, just leave, just leave him here and I won't bother you. And of course, 
She's tricked him into taking on the DNA bombs, but again, that won't bother him unless he tries to attack her. And he's still got the chance to get home and heal himself. This is a Doctor who's not interested in an eye for an eye. This is a Doctor who wants as many people as possible to survive. It might be a bit uncomfortable from a human standpoint that Rahul and Kebab Man and all the people the Stenza have taken or killed aren't avenged in this story. But I think this Doctor doesn't see that as her role as an Avenger. She says at the end, I'm just trying to help out where I can. Even Grace's death, the Doctor tries to prevent. And I think it's super important that Grace doesn't die trying to impress or save the Doctor. Grace dies trying to save her grandson. And succeeding, in fact. And even then, her last thoughts are to comfort Graham. We get that beautiful funeral scene and the Doctor sticks around. The Doctor doesn't usually stick around for this kind of thing. The Doctor will usually swan off. Now here, of course, she doesn't have her TARDIS, but she's got legs. She could just leave, but she elects not to. She tries to comfort Ryan. We get Graham's beautiful eulogy. I love the fact that we're in a more modern church instead of the temptation would have been to have it in a big cathedral type church or even just an old stone chapel. But instead, it's a modern church. It's got an overhead projector screen. It's this pentagonal building. Ryan's dad doesn't turn up, and we still have tension between Ryan and Graham, so we've set up these character dynamics for the season. Finally, the new costumes aim. Look, it harks back to Robot, it harks back to Time and the Rani, even the 11th hour, especially with the Doctor throwing stuff out. I love the observation of Yaz is the one holding the clothes, presumably more clothes for the Doctor to try on, or maybe she's cleaning up after, I don't know, and Ryan's just checking his phone. And then when the Doctor says, what do you think of the outfit? Yas is shocked, and Ryan just looks up and, yeah, right. He doesn't care what she's wearing. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's a nicely observed piece of humour. And then we get the final scene where the Doctor's trying to get back to her TARDIS. We get a cliffhanger ending. The only cliffhanger ending of this season, because it's all single episode stories. But that cliffhanger ending where they land in space, that got such a shocked laugh in the cinema. It was palpable, and there's this feeling of, oh my god, how do they get out of this, and I want to see this next week. But just before that, I love the line of, oh, you look at you three, I'm almost going to miss you. This doctor is developing this habit of saying something rude, but just in a really offhand tone of voice, so you don't actually know whether you've been insulted. And considering a lot of the time she's very sort of talkative, and one might even say sweet or personable, when those comments come in, as a viewer, it takes you a second or so <laughs> to hear it, which makes it even funnier. There's that Tom Baker quality of playing against the line, of announcing a death with a smile on your face, or saying you're exactly where you're intended to be, but oh, we're exactly where we're intended to be. One more thing I want to mention is Segun Akinola's music. It's a shame we don't get the opening titles here, but I'll talk about them more next week. But Segun's music is so different from Murray Gold's. Murray Gold's is kind of big band and bombastic, whereas Segun Akinola's is... It's quiet and moody and radiophonic. And there's one particular bit, because I watched this with headphones, where Rahul is driving the pod back to his garage. And there's kind of a staticky noise in the soundtrack, but it moves from ear to ear. It's kind of unnerving. It's a little bit seasicky, to be honest with you. And yeah, I really, really love that. I give this story 8 out of 10. Last year it was only a 7 out of 10, but this rewatch, it's actually gone up in my estimation. As I say, the first 20 minutes are a bit odd, but it's always hard pacing regeneration stories. Don't forget to come back tomorrow when I'll be saying something nice about a 1980 episode of Doctor Who. But until then, thank you very much for watching.